Okay, it looks like most people are here. Um, good evening and welcome to the CVUSD Parent Guardian Workshop, Creating Healthy Screen Habits. Um, my name is Rebecca Cook and I am a counselor with the CVUSD Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, for those of you who would like to access interpretation, um, you are able to do so. Um, Amy, if you would click to the next slide, it explains how families can access translation. Um, so you'll just click the interpretation icon on your Zoom window and choose Spanish. And then you'll click mute original audio. So you're just hearing the Spanish translation. Thank you. Um, Breakthrough and the Caneo Schools Foundation are excited to welcome Amy Adams and Hillary Wilkinson, founders of Healthy Screen Habits here tonight to share tips and strategies um, to create healthy screen habits for the whole family. If questions arise during the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A box and we'll be answering them um, during the Q&A portion of the presentation at the end. And that will be facilitated by Brenda Rachels, um, who is also a counselor uh, with the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. We do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, please know this evening's webinar is recorded and will be posted on the Conejo USD YouTube channel. Um, I will turn it over to Amy and Hillary to get started. Thank you all for being here. Okay, good evening. I'm Amy Adams, and thank you for spending your evening with us tonight. It's always hard to come, you know, to carve out time in the evening hours, and we appreciate you guys being here with us. This presentation is designed to empower you. So we don't want you to leave feeling stressed or anxious. We've, and we've compiled a framework of research, information, and tools to help you and your family create your healthiest screen habits. So let's get started. Okay, so Healthy Screen Habits is a nonprofit organization, and we are an organization that believes in really capturing the best of technology. We believe technology is great. Intentional use of technology is great. And through the use of the of fMRIs, it's allowed us to see the inner workings of the brain. And surprise, Portions of our brain are not fully developed until around age 25. So take a deep breath and relax. If you've ever asked your teenager why they did something and they said, came back with, I don't know, it's, it's actually the truth. And it's important in relation to healthy screen habits because we need to recognize that our kids have not yet developed the parts they need to determine limits around screen time and on their own. And this puts the onus on us. Okay, so we're gonna look at our kids through the lens of child development. And this is gonna give us some insight into how and why tech affects them. Okay, so we're gonna start by looking at kids ages five to 13, school age kids. And the main question during this developmental phase is, what am I good at? So according to the German-American child development theorist, Eric Erickson, the main developmental task of elementary age kids is figuring out what they're good at. So one of the key ways they build competencies is through doing and performing. So this is the stage where they love to build Legos and paint, make slime. If any of you have had kids this age, you know that this is a messy stage, okay? Um, they like to create friendship bracelets and perform for others. So performative social media platforms like TikTok and YouTube are especially appealing to this age set because they capitalize upon user-generated content. Kids love to create videos and post them as well as watching the creations of others. So if you've ever wondered why it's so easy for your child to get sucked into these apps, it's because it speaks to their developmental need to be good at something. Autoplay and the endless scroll ensure that they stay on these platforms for large chunks of time, larger than uh, they probably want to or you probably want them to. And many kids at this age want to be TikTok famous or gain giant followings on YouTube. I know many parents can relate to that feeling. And as parents, you can help channel this built-in drive to perform during these years by providing offline experiences and hands-on activities to foster feelings of competence. We know it's messy, but it's awesome. 
And we're gonna discuss how to do this later on. So remember that most kids this age are unable to moderate and self-regulate in terms of time spent online. They need your help. And you can help by discussing and agreeing upon time limits with your kids. You can also use screen time found in your Apple settings or digital wellness found in Android settings. And this can help you put limits on, you know, around certain apps or certain websites. And it's really great. So I, I, we highly recommend it. Some kids do well to have a visual reminder of time passing. And we actually have one here for the little or set. This is a really great tool. Um, it's called the time timer. And it's just, it's something that can help them actually see visually how much time they have left. So that's a little, little tip and trick there. Okay, so let's move on to the older set here. Um, adolescence, take a deep breath. Uh, I have three of my children are actually in this phase right now and I work at a high school. So I am surrounded pretty much 24 seven by kids this age. Um, and the main question during this age is who am I? Identity, they're trying to figure that out. Um, that is the critical task of adolescence. So Eric Erickson labeled this stage identity versus role confusion. Teens are trying on a whole lot of identities. Just think back to your teenage years and all the different things that you might cringe out now, cringe on right now, but that back then were very big to you because um, they're trying to figure out who they are. And technology has majorly impacted identity formation because it exposes teens to many, many voices online. Um, constant exposure to these voices can be overwhelming during this critical time as they try to nav navigate and cultivate who they are. According to Common Sense Media, um, their census of 2022, the average teen spends between eight to nine hours um, on their screens for entertainment. That's outside of schoolwork. That's a lot, and that's per day. So there will always be someone else telling them what to think or feel or be. Social media algorithms pick up on the slightest hesitation over a particular video when scrolling, and then we'll start feeding them more content like that. Um, like they've, and, and Wall Street Journal has done extensive, like kind of like an expose on this. And it's, if you're interested, you can Google, you know, TikTok algorithms and Wall Street Journal. So radicalization is also increasing as teens find themselves going down rabbit holes of various interest groups. So the bottom line, it's important for your kids to, to spend some time alone to get to know themselves. Um, they can, when, when they're alone with themselves, they can um, develop their interests that feed and nourish their growing sense of self and spend time away from the constant feedback of online life. This can be really hard to do in our constantly connected world. So parents, we play a vital role in ensuring that our teens get time away from their devices so that they can get to know themselves. It's the most important relationship they're ever going to have, and it's with themselves. Um, so we'll be covering a little bit later on a few easy ways to get this time alone built into your family structure. Okay, so moving on to the next phase. Now, we realize that the, we're presenting for kids in this district that are K through 12, but this is right around the corner for many families, and it's young adulthood. Okay, so the main question in young adulthood is, how will I find connection? Um so we need to set them up with the best tools and strategies to have success during this stage. Young adults are looking to connect with others to form these lasting romantic bonds. And tech can interfere with this stage because many social media interactions, dating apps, and adult content are not conducive to promoting lasting relationships and are actually just more focused on quick hookups. This can leave young adults feeling lonely and isolated. We can teach them now in their younger years about what healthy relationships and caregiving actually look like. We can provide opportunities to have offline interactions that give experiences of compassion, selflessness, and care. So now that we've spoken a little bit about your child's development, let's move on to, um, to discuss a little bit about motivation. We're going to talk about what motivates all of us to act. So the self-determination theory holds that we're motivated by three main needs. Those are autonomy, belonging, and competence. And we, of course, we all like autonomy because everyone wants to be in charge of their own life. We all want to be in control of our lives. Um, we want to belong because, surprise, human beings are social creatures. 
And everyone wants to be competent because it's important to have something you feel good about. Tech can be particularly tricky because it takes advantage of all these motivations and kind of hijacks them. So tech allows for autonomy by design. Kids can do things and perform, perform tasks way beyond their physical capabilities online. Kids often turn online to find belonging and develop competence. Girls especially are drawn to social media as they search for meaningful connections. Likes, follows, sh and shares create a false sense of belonging and bring about a sort of scorekeeping. Boys often find their tribe through gaming communities compiled of people who may or may not have their best interests in mind. So through the process of leveling up or getting loot boxes and comparison of scores, a sense of value and competency is, um, you know, kind of a false sense is, is achieved for them. So it's important to understand that while online connections do provide value and perhaps some skill sets of online behavior, socially, it's of lower quality than face-to-face -face interactions. We feel a deeper sense of belonging when we are with people offline and connecting face to face. I think we've all kind of experienced that in our lives, right? No amount of followers can make up for sitting alone at the lunch table at school. So parents, you can help your kids by helping to arrange face to face social experiences and fostering activities that, um, that really build skill development and competency. So like we previously talked about, the teenage brain is not fully developed until around the ages of 24 to 26. And during this process of maturation and throughout life, it's really important we maintain this balance of happy chemicals in our body. And these chemicals produced within the body are also called neurotransmitters or messengers. They greatly affect mood and perception of self. There are well over 100 neurotransmitters in the human body, but the four listed here are kind of like the, the A-list celebrities at the moment. We've got dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. These are the neurotransmitters that are known to have effects on feelings of contentment, happiness, belonging, and these four chemicals can get hijacked through the overuse of technology in a variety of ways. So we're going to take just a minute and dive a little deeper into each one. Dopamine big sexy celebrity neurotransmitter of the moment. It gets a lot of airtime when talking about addiction and in regards to the development of what they could refer to as the stickiness of apps, our inability to get off of it. It's in charge of anticipation and the feel good release in the brain's reward system. We get the greatest hits of dopamine when using a variable system of rewards also known as unpredictable outcomes with potential for winning. So slot machines are incredibly good at hooking people by using that variable system of rewards. Sometimes you pull that arm and it just spins and other times it's a big payout. So guess who else uses the variable system of rewards? It's the phone in your pocket. And this is not a design flaw by big tech. This was intentional persuasive design. The phone in your pocket or on the desktop next to you has been compared to being the world's smallest slot machine. Sometimes you check it, you get a really great feel good text or the picture you posted just gained a whole bunch of likes, but sometimes you check it and there's nothing or even something you don't wanna see. So it's this unpredictability of what's there that drives us to check it and check it and check it. And that is the pull of dopamine. It creates craving. And that is the manipulation of the pleasure pathways in the brain, which also is a setup for addiction. Serotonin is one of the chemicals responsible for maintaining mood balance and overall feelings of well being. A deficit of serotonin may lead to depression. So it's important to monitor levels. 75% uh, of serotonin is produced in the gastrointestinal system. And this is very important because we know that when we overuse technology, 
we tend to choose convenience over nutrition. So sugary, salty snack foods reign supreme, and this can wreak havoc on serotonin production and overall well-being. When we touch with warmth and comfort, we encourage the release of oxytocin. It's a neurotransmitter responsible for feelings of bonding and closeness. It's the same neurotransmitter released during feeding of infants that promotes maternal closeness. And the use of tech is a physically isolating practice. We tend to sit by ourselves, we wall off from connection, and that's something to just bear in mind. So endorphins are ones that most people know of. They get released during or following exercise. They're known to elevate mood, increase pain tolerance, reduce stress. And when we overuse tech, we generally tend to be more sedentary, which deprives us of these much needed benefits and natural incentives to move. A body in motion wants more motion, a body at rest wants to stay seated. And this can lead to a disconnection of physical wellness between body and mind. So all of these are kind of multifactorial in checking in with overall wellness. Tech, de tech developers figured out a really great secret, and that's that outrage equals attention. And the reason why this is important is because attention equals money when dealing with the online market. The longer you stare at a screen, the more opportunities there are for advertisements to be pushed your way. And knowing that humans by nature will stare at two people fighting longer than we'll stare at two people like talking softly over coffee. Apps and algorithms use this to their advantage. It's not that tech companies are intentionally, malevolently trying to enrage you, but they're a business model. Their algorithms are serving up the things that make you stare longer. It's an attention economy. Teens can become especially susceptible to this due to the facts they tend to feel higher highs and lower lows. So parents, you can help your teen curate their feeds, their social media feeds to follow positive people. You can check in with what accounts they follow, being aware that radicalization feeds upon outrage and teens often get targeted. Encourage them to turn off notifications, stay in, stay in charge of their time, and talk with them about how various accounts make them feel. If they have a negative association with certain accounts or others that produce really incendiary feelings, this might be an indicator that they should put that account on pause. Okay, so in the natural world, there's lots of stopping cues. For example, when we, you know, when we eat a meal, our stomachs feel full and tell us like, okay, stop eating. We're, we're good. We're done. When the sun goes down for millennial, it was a sign to everyone that the work is over for the day. Go home and go to bed. Books have chapters. Newspapers are short. So those are all stopping cues. But surprise, surprise, tech has no such thing. And this is on purpose. You can pretty much scroll forever and ever. The For You page on TikTok, discover on Snapchat, explore on Instagram, and autoplay on YouTube and Netflix ensures that you'll actually never leave. And that's how you get sucked into the time vortex. So if you've ever wondered why you only meant to spend 10 minutes on your phone, but suddenly looked up and realized that literally two hours has passed, that's the reason. And it's not your fault. This is why it's important to set timers and limits for yourself and your kids. This affects everyone. This isn't just a kid thing. This is really all of us. And this can help bring a sense of balance and sense of control. And we use tech. Okay, so human beings, by our nature, we want to be comfortable. We want to always be moving towards a state of comfort. And the trick is learning how to deal with discomfort in an emotionally healthy way. 
But unfortunately, current tendencies towards dealing with big emotions by using screens to distract or numb are creating big problems. We're seeing screens as kind of pacifiers here. So um, kids can find themselves locked in this cycle that is creating vulnerability rather than building strength and resilience. So let's look at the cycle. Okay, so there's three points on the cycle and vulnerability can begin at any one of these points. Because we have to choose an entry point, let's start with talking about emotional discomfort or like we like to call them big feelings, which is the box on the left of your screen. Childhood and teen years have a lot of uncomfortable moments. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's a time of massive change and self-exploration and change is really hard. Learning, although satisfying, is hard. When it becomes overwhelming, our kids seek to move towards comfort by self-regulation or self-soothing. But often due to digital convenience or not knowing how to self-soothe, kids turn to digital distraction. This is a problem because distraction is actually not self-care. The use of digital, digital distraction can in turn become an overuse of technology. So this excessive unchecked time on screens and social media can lead to compare and despair phenomena, can lead to early access or accidental exposure to inappropriate disturbing material, and it establishes an overall habit of using distraction in place of self-care, which is what we don't want. Having no resolution of the original issues that led towards comfort seeking, kids become trapped in this never ending cycle. This little loop is perpetually moving here and they're stuck inside. So the worse they feel, the more they wanna use a screen, which in turn makes them feel worse and use more. So how do we break the cycle? It's actually easier than you think. And the antidote is connecting to our bodies, our feelings and others. So first and foremost, our physical needs must be met. And we know from studying American psychologist Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs that if these needs are not met, no other higher order of operations or self-care or soothing can be reached or will it be effective. So we need insulation from entering the cycle of vulnerability, and it involves continually kind of building this awareness. By teaching our kids awareness of their physical needs, we are in essence helping them build a shelter or a shed for survival and resilience. And this acronym SHED, S-H-E-D, is a really good one. Even my kids often refer to, they get their head in the shed when they need to check in, you know, and see if they're not feeling well. It's like, well, let me get my head in the shed. And so you can just go through it. S is for sleep. So we, we, all, we all know by now, sleep is fundamental to physical and mental health. And tech has negatively affected sleep patterns across all ages. The combination of blue light with those addictive algorithms lead to many hours of lost sleep. You need to remove tech from your children's bedrooms. They cannot regulate usage without your help. It is designed to keep them engaged. It is not their fault. And it's not your fault if you can't disengage. So you need to remove tech from the bedrooms. H is for hydration. It's essential to get enough to drink each day. Even slight dehydration can impair cognitive function or physical performance. And when kids are gaming for long periods of time or they get distracted really for a long time online, they tend to ignore their physical need to drink because they're so engrossed. So again, set a timer, take a water break. Timer, that one. <laughs> E is for exercise. Now, Harvard School of Public Health found that running for 15 minutes a day or walking, which is what I do, for an hour reduces the risk of major depression by 26%. Like, we just need to get moving. Studies have shown that daily exercise for kids with ADHD helps improve mental flexibility, attention, working memory, and those higher executive functions. It also increases the production of endorphins, those neurotransmitters we talked before about for that overall feel good effect. And the D in shed is for diet. Simply put, 
food affects mood. It's like a luxury car. Your body and your brain function best when given premium fuel. Okay, so once we've met these physiological needs, our social and emotional needs become tantamount. This is where the real work begins of finding balance and building resilience in our families. So we've created a little acronym to help you remember the key components of balance and resilience. And these different components spell out the word centered. Being centered is what shields you from infiltration of those things that put you in the cycle of vulnerability. It's a combination of internal and external factors that are both preventative and curative. So because technology is often used to distract and escape big feelings, um, we must teach our kids what to do with big feelings instead of using tech, instead of just turning to tech. So by using the tools introduced in the centered approach, you're going to find yourself balanced, strong, and able to bounce back from difficult experiences. So you'll also see that many of these ideas are common sense. You're, they're going to click with you because you're going to be like, yeah, 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 I know that, I know that. But remember, common knowledge is not the same as common practice. Okay, so let's jump right in. C, C is for connection. I feel like I'm on Sesame Street. We're going to introduce our C. <laughs> C is for connection. Of all the strategies discussed in getting centered, connecting is the most important, overarching, protected one against entering into that cycle of vulnerability. We need to connect with our environments, our bodies, our emotions, and each other. The digital world works as a distraction, or shall we say a disconnect from those things. So as author and researcher Brene Brown states, connection is actually why we're here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. So connection is protection. Think about how you and your family can connect with one each other, with each other. Is it making family dinners a priority? Is it giving all devices a curfew so only person-to-person -person interactions are happening? There's lots of different ways to connect and every family is gonna be a little different. Last night, my family went to a basketball game and it was such a connecting experience. We all got to cheer for our, my son. So that was a way that we could connect. Um, we're gonna move on to E. E is for emotional awareness. Now, emotional awareness is the ability to recognize and make sense of our emotions, both in yourself and in other people. It's actually key to understanding what makes you tick. So learning to actually label the feelings is the first step towards processing them. Dan Siegel, a renowned researcher out of UCLA, uses the phrase, and we love it. He says, name it to tame it. By learning to name emotions, kids can identify steps needed to tame them. And children learn best through example. Sharing your own feelings, both positive and actually negative as well, can give your children the permission to talk about their big feelings as well. Um, and on the Healthy Screen Habits website, you'll find an emotional literacy printable that we created with directions on how to use it in your family to foster emotional awareness. So the N in centered is for nature and nature is where just many things seem to fall in place. Like John Muir said, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. And part of this is this multi-sensory experience we receive in nature, sight, sound, smells, temperatures, they all kind of amplify and the experience provides a mental and physical reset really towards wellness. And this calming of our senses when watching animals in their natural habitat or experiencing a beautiful sunset is described as awe. And interestingly, awe is one of the predictors of good mental health. So this slow fascination of as we observe living things outside the realm of our everyday life, it just like commands our attention and draws focus outside of oneself, which creates space and kindness and for kindness and compassion towards others. When we experience nature through technology, like we're looking at this beautiful picture on the screen, we're experiencing nature through technology versus immersing ourselves in our natural environment. It's really as different as looking at a picture of an apple versus holding an apple in your hand and taking a bite out of it. In our digital age, we find ourselves and our attention removed from natural settings and their inherent soothing and effect. And instead, we're placed in artificial environments that increase distress. 
So taking a walk, looking at the trees outside can be a calming technique when feeling agitated. And it, you can employ this in your own family by thinking about some of the opportunities that you have to connect with the natural world around your home. T is for touch. When we touch with warmth and comfort, we encourage that release of oxytocin. In utero, touch is the first of our five senses to develop. It emerges around eight weeks post-conception and touch actually has the ability to lower our heart rate, decrease stress hormones, and touch communicates and connects more quickly than speech. Instinctively, that maternal response towards distress to pick up and hold a small child, it's like calming them down. As our kids age, we often mistakenly think that the need for touch diminishes, but this is simply not true. So sometimes it feels kind of awkward to hug your teenager when they're being a little cold and prickly, but it's exactly what they need. There's this power of eight, eight second hugs per day that's something that's found its way into the common culture, thanks to the research of Dr. Christy Kane. And this is, it's an easy way, that power of eight is an easy way to remember the maximum, or excuse me, the amount of touch needed to receive maximum benefit. And touch really centers us in a way that technology simply can't. Overwhelming digital fascination takes us away from personal contact. Now, interestingly, an area not to be overlooked or understated is that Amy's laughing because I, I love this. I'm the child of two veterinarians. It's the human animal connection or the pet person bond. And pets are psychologically always safe. They're non-judgmental, aside from some cats that we know, <laughs> non-competitive. And the benefits we receive from simply sitting with a cat on our lap or patting our dogs are huge. You cannot underestimate the healing powers of touch and connection with our animal companions. The use of therapy animals in like a variety of distressing situations illustrates the efficacy of incorporating animals in our lives. So think about how you can incorporate the power of touch into your family. Remember dogs count, cats count. So think about how you can employ that. I just have to make the comment that Hillary is the reason why my family has two cats. <laughs> I was never a pet person. We didn't have pets growing up, but we are now proud pet people because my kids go and touch pet the cats when they're having a hard day. So thank you, Hillary. So E is for enthusiasms or hobbies. Enthusiasms include sports or cooking, collection building, artistic endeavors, textile arts. Many of those things that 20 years ago were the activities we did in our spare time. We pursue these things just for the sheer enjoyment of doing them. They're called high value leisure activities by social scientists, and they typically involve productivity, creativity, and patience, as well as manipulation of the physical world through our bodies. They're different than the interests of our digital world. The thing with enthusiasms though, is that they take time. And time is something that is rapidly diminishing in our day due to our digital connections and distractions. Researchers have found that we are spending less time with our enthusiasms and more time online. There's an interesting study that was done where they asked a bunch of people, what were their, what adults, what their hobbies were. And they, a lot of them couldn't even think of any hobbies because People mostly now just spend time online in their free time. And he, his comment was, oh, that's so sad because 20 years ago, we all had so many hobbies. Um, so online activities, they're of lower value because although they take our time and attention, they don't provide that same fulfillment and satisfaction when we're done. Um, and our children need many options to have in their toolbox to soothe them after a hard day. These coping skills often result in tangible products or social interactions that build well-rounded individuals. They provide resilience building through feelings of accomplishment and skill building. So what are your hobbies and interests? What about your kids? Have you found that you spend less time on your hobbies and enthusiasms than you did years ago because tech is stealing your time? 
think about maybe something new you want to try or maybe something new you can do together as a family. I know we like to make cookies. We make cookies twice a week in our family and it's something we can all do together, both making and eating them. So that's, that's something we do. R, R is for relationships. So Harvard conducted the longest longitudinal study ever. It was, it's an, it's an 84 year study and still going. And they found, and it was about development, adult development. And they found that the key to happiness and health could be summed up in one word. And that word is relationships. So there's three main types of relationships we have in our lives. We have a relationship with family and friends. We have relationship with ourselves and we have relationships with a higher power. And parenting is not a job, it's a relationship. So all the things that you can do to help your child build a strong, um, so sorry, of all the things you can do to help your child, building a solid relationship with them is the most important. Research shows that this is the best predictor of healthy outcome. Knowing that you are always there for them allows children to feel safe, seen, and soothed, which is the basis for a secure attachment for our kids. And tech is actually making it increasingly difficult for us to truly see and know our children as we are all distracted by screens. So we're spending less time together and building those relationships a little bit less. So friendships also play a vital role in the well being of our kids. We're living in a world where we are connected with thousands of friends online, and yet many feel the sting of loneliness in real life. We're the most lonely generation. Online social interactions provide value, but it's of much lower quality than face-to-face -face interactions. It's kind of like junk food in comparison to an apple. Our children are spending less time in higher quality social interactions and more time with lower quality interactions online. Even when they are face-to-face -face with friends, the ever-present and interrupting phone cheapens these rich face-to-face -face interactions. So also finally, a relationship with self is critical for healthy development. Our children need time to get to know themselves and explore who they are. This relationship is cultivated in moments of peace and quiet offline. Our world is so frenetic that our children hardly know what calm even feels like anymore. So it's crucial that you help them carve out screen-free time alone. You know, it kind of seems like a novel concept these days, but... A simple notebook can help your children put words to their inner world as writing gives voice to feelings and ideas. Some children may like drawing in a sketchbook or strumming a guitar in their rooms, um, but whatever you do, it's provide a way for them to have this opportunity to be alone. And when they're facing big emotions, they can find peace through reflection as they process these deep feelings. Finally, a relationship with a higher power can be a source of calm and peace, especially during difficult moments. Whether that is found in a connection to nature or to a deity, cultivating this relationship can help them have a place to turn to for strength in moments of difficulty and stress. So meaningful relationships take time and hard work. There's no shortcut here. And that's the thing with tech. Tech provides like a really simple and quick thing. And we think, oh, it's a shortcut to all these friends. But if you want to have the best quality, you got to put in the hard work. The benefit of those efforts is that your children will have a safe place to turn to when confronting a difficult problem or a situation. So think about the relationships in your children's lives and how you can strengthen those really important bonds. So I keep coming back to that E of exercise. I referred to it previously when talking about helping kids build their shed to meet their physical needs. And when talking about the kind of helpful quality of endorphins and mood regulation and spending time online like is inherently sedentary. Some online activities like gaming or social media cause the body to release stress hormones. And without movement, these stress hormones continue to build and build without release. We have to move our bodies to expend this pent up energy. Exercise can be something kids turn to when they are experiencing those big feelings, keeping them out of that cycle of vulnerability. In a difficult moment, it can be used as a coping strategy. 
And this exercise doesn't have to be long or complicated. It can be as simple as jumping jacks, running around the block, go up the stairs and come down two times. You know, so think about what are some of the ways that you like to move your bodies as in your family, everybody's different. So it, it helps to pre-think these so that when you are in moments of stress, you already know what to tell your kids. Oh, why don't you go jump on the trampoline? You know, that might work for one. Why don't you go, do, you know, run around the block for another? And our last letter in centered is D for doing good. So we often feel isolated and disconnected when we sit alone with our devices. We all need to know that we matter in the world. And doing good includes contributing to the greater good of the world in both big and small ways. It encompasses chores, volunteering, working at a job. A job well done leaves us feeling satisfied, knowing that we've contributed to the enrichment of our community. So you can create a culture of doing good in your family by making it a habit to occasionally ask. You don't want to harp on it too much because then you become the, you know, it becomes just the thing that they start tuning out. But make it, you know, occasionally ask like in the car or at the dinner table, what did you do to help someone today? Or on the way to school, you can pre-think it and kind of go, oh, what are you going to, what are you going to look for today to help somebody? So our centered approach provides many coping strategies to use other than technology to self-soothe. When you get centered, you find yourself balanced, strong, and able to bounce back from difficult experiences. Connection builds resilience. For more tools on how to help your children feel centered, my colleague and I have developed a great tool that you can find on, online on our website. It's called What to Do in Feeling Meh, and you can help your child fill it out to help them find balance and realize that they have a lot of options besides turning to tech when they're upset, because that's what we want. We want them to feel like there are other things to do, and we kind of live in a world where we've forgotten about those other things. So that's our hope with Centered that you can kind of remember some of those other things that really do make us feel good. So as the name of our organization implies, Healthy Screen Habits, we want to help families create healthy screen habits. On our website, you'll find five core healthy screen habits. And since time is short, we wanted to leave you with the one habit that will give you the biggest bang for your buck, we promise. So here it is. Make it a habit to keep phones and devices out of kids' bedrooms and bathrooms. If I could have everyone do just one thing, this would be it. I promise this will give you the best bang for your back here. So there's, there's actually five reasons, and we're just going to quickly go over them. Time is very short, but those we call them the five S's. One of them is sleep disruptions. As Hillary has talked about before, we need sleep. And let me tell you, the phones are the biggest robbers of sleep right now. If you want to know why your kid is cranky or angry or depressed, we can trace a lot of our mental health issues and our physical issues back to lack of sleep. So let's get, let's help them um, get the sleep they need by, by removing that like glowing light that always is the siren call of the phone. Sketchy contents. Um, kids are more likely to encounter questionable content behind closed doors, sexual predators, and predators go where the kids are and kids are online. In fact, I went to a presentation last week where they um, talked about the number one way that kids are solicited or that sexual exploitation is happening is online. And that's in Ventura County right here. So let's give them less access to our kids who are most vulnerable at night behind closed doors social isolation, keeping kids out of, or keeping phones out of bedrooms reduces the social isolation because kids are less likely to self-isolate in their rooms without phones. This promotes family bonding and togetherness. We have a family room or family room is called a family room because it's supposed to be a place where we gather. So let's use our family rooms to gather and get, get, you know, get our kids really connected with each other. Finally, the last S is our stolen sanctuary. Kids deserve a break. Their bedroom should be a sanctuary where they can be free from the constant reminder and notifications of status. 
status is constantly being assessed from likes and follows to constant access to grades and their sports stats from their last game. This is super, super anxiety provoking in our children. This is my number one thing I, I love to talk about because it, if we can do this, we need, if we can provide them that special sanctuary where they don't have to worry what other people are thinking about them. They don't have to see how they're being judged or what their grades are. Let's, let's give them a chance to have really truly have a break and unwind after a long day. So we've covered a lot of info in this talk and some of you might be thinking, well, this is all well and good, but how do I start? And this is where you, we recommend you start. This is the Healthy Screen Habits Family Tech Plan. It's a one page free downloadable printable document and can act as a conversational springboard to get your family talking about technology and the role you want it to play in your relationship. It covers device safety and boundary setting. It's meant to be a living agreement that can be adjusted with the ages and stages of all families. It's a customizable blueprint for defining the boundaries around tech in your family. You know your family best, so you know what's going to work. The one thing I can say is by having all family members contribute to the tech plan, all family members get their fingerprints on the blueprint, and there's better likelihood of buy-in and follow through with all members of the family. Additionally, we have the Healthy Screen Habits podcast, and this is available wherever you listen to podcasts. It provides you with access to expert research and real life moms as we talk about just all things tech. It's 30 minutes. You can put me on double speed. I'm the host. You put me on double speed and then get me done and get it done in 15 minutes. You get a healthy screen habit, which is a tip or takeaway to try out in your home with every episode. And if you're interested in specific topics such as teens and tech or social media or other specifics, you can visit our episodes by topic which is sort of a library where you can find episodes grouped by topic. You get there by going to healthyscreenhabits.org, click on the podcast button, and then scroll down to find episodes by topic. So we have greatly enjoyed spending time with you this evening, and we'd love for you to stick around a few minutes longer as we move to the Q&A portion. Thank you, Amy and Hillary, for being with us tonight. You guys have brought some great information to our families. Um, we got a lot of questions, so we're going to move into that Q&A. Uh, many of them were submitted upon registration, but if you have any questions that have just arose for you during this conversation, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many as possible. So let's just jump right in. Um, just want to start off with, uh, this came through from, there, from a lot of parents, just if there was a certain amount of screen time that's recommended for specific age groups, and is there anything that they want to differentiate between screen time on weekends versus weekdays? Okay, so the American Academy of Pediatrics has really strict guidelines for the very young. There is no screen time except for video chatting with loved ones for babies up to 18 months. There's minimal screen time and only with an adult for like, like co-viewing with for toddlers from 18 months to two years and no more than one hour per day of screen media entertainment for preschoolers. And then from there, it gets really tricky because of the use of tech in education. And we start talking less about overall screen time and more about, we use the phrase recreational screen time. And it seems like, honestly, like of all the organizations, I mean, I'm talking American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Psychiatry, nobody wants to assign hard, fast numbers. So I'm going to, I can tell you what the general agreed upon amount is, and that is and it kind of makes me laugh that they make this big jump from ages six to 17, 
which there, we can all agree there's a big difference between a six-year-old and a 17-year-old. There's a huge leap in growth and development. And the agreed upon numbers are you want to aim for less than two hours of recreational screen time use per weekday. And the issue of greater importance that we think at Healthy Screen Habits is what is the time online taking away from? So you want to assess what is that screen time not allowing for? So you want to focus on making time for other important activities as well. And, um, you know, one to two hours of physical activity, a full night's sleep, meals as a family, screen-free relaxation time. So, I mean, it's it, it depends on, on the family, obviously. And I think, did you... Brenda, did you ask about the changes from weekdays to weekends? Yeah. So some parents were like, okay, so on the weekends, their kids may say, you know, it's a weekend. I can be on the screen more because I don't have homework. So, I mean, it sounds like it's just a matter of, it's just not as healthy for them. They need to be finding other things. So just your thoughts on that. Yeah, but I can tell you that according to, you know, the bodies, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera, they're, they, they don't differentiate it out, but I think, and Amy, chime in here if you, yeah. you know, um, it's an issue really for you to decide on with your family. If you're and like, what constitutes countable, if you will, hours, like, or if, if you're watching a movie with a family, with your family for movie night, like, does that count? Like if your child's looking up how to build something on YouTube and then using that information and going outside and using that, like, does that count? It's screens are so just everywhere in our lives. It's hard to, it, it gets very tricky when people want to say like, well, how much screen time? And it's like, well, what is it being, what screen time I think is important. And what is it taking away from like this whole displacement theory of, are we taking time away from our kids actually playing outside in the natural world? Are we taking time away from time we could spend together as a family? Are we taking time away from time spent by themselves in their rooms doodling? I mean, those are all things that are really important for optimal growth and development for our kids. So just, we, we, we really that. promote a balanced approach yeah. to this. Yeah. And, and we looking at it case by case, it sounds like, depending yeah. on doing yeah. what they're doing. Okay. Right. Um, Here's another question that came in. It was a great question is how do you limit social media when uh, your child's friends have unlimited access? And so the kid is feeling left out, but they're not able to participate as much as their friends are. Okay. So that's a great question. And like I said, I have four kids of my own and three teenagers. So I, I have lived this question myself. And basically the rule of thumb with social media is delay, delay, delay. We've all seen, it's kind of common knowledge now, all the stats that have come out and the studies about some of the negative effects that have too much social media on our kids. And there's a case of the whistleblower with the Facebook with Francis Hogan that really talked about how Facebook or meta as they're called now, they knew that this was happening and kind of just put it under the rug. And so we have to be really look at this from the, the idea of, is this helping my child or is this hurting my child? So we, like we said before, we really believe in a, in a kind of a theory of moderation and a gradual like entrance into that social media world. And really social media platforms are designed just by law. Um, a child needs to be 13 in order to even have a social media platform. And many, many researchers have actually said 16 is actually a better number for that. Um, the Jean Twenge out of San Diego State has done extensive research on this and she actually studied happiness. I'm gonna show you a slide here. Let's see, okay, you guys can see that. And they talk about happiness and kids who spend, you know, more time, 10 or more hours a week on social media. Media in eighth grade, they were 56% more likely to report that they were unhappy. Now compare that to the number of kids in 12th grade and that number goes down to 20%. So when I saw those stats, it's like, okay, so what, what is that telling me? That, that's telling me that the older we start them, 
the less damage and the less harm it's going to have. But to your question of what do we do when all their friends are on there, um, we can we can set timers. So I use app. Uh, we have apples. We're an Apple family, not an Android family. So I'm, I don't work for Apple, but we do use Apple devices, and I love their screen time. Um, and what I use screen time for is I put certain timers and I do this for myself too on those apps. You can find it in settings. Yeah, find it in settings. And you can say, for example, Instagram. So I give my son a 15 minute Instagram timer every day. So he's not just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling forever on Instagram. I give myself the same amount of time. Um, and it just is really, really helpful that it kind of helps them. They can still connect, but they're not lost in the forever compare, compare, scroll, scroll, death, you know, doom scroll. Yeah. Amy, and I like the slide. It's sorry, Hillary, go ahead. No, that's okay. I was going to say, and what we really recommend also is prior to your child having their own social media account, you spend a lot of time doing, train them for having a social media account. I, you know, go through your account with them and you can share with them how different accounts make you feel. And, oh, I had to unfollow this lady because, you know, she's got the most perfect kitchen and I, it makes me sad, <laughs> you know? I mean, you can you can share things that, that how it affects you you and then you also can give them practice by maybe they create the posts that go on your feed and so you want to practice things like getting consent from everybody who's in an image like is it okay that I share this with you know online you also want to talk about like what's the language that you use when you're commenting and so you you do a lot of practice before giving them before like granting them access to their own accounts. It's a lot like driving. We don't just hand kids the keys to the car and say, make good choices. You know, I mean, there is a lot of time and development and practical training that goes into highway safety. And we need to do equal amounts of time in the digital realm. So what do we do? Like you talked about kids are a lot unhappier when they're on screen time. So one of the parents had wrote in that, how can they uh, assist or support their child? Because they know every time they get off screen time, they're in a bad mood. And so like, how do you help shift them into a better headspace? Okay, this is a really common theme. So all the parents out there, we feel you. We know this is really, really hard, okay? And we're the parents of six kids between the two of us. So we 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 feel your pain. So we have a few little strategies. Number one, uh, when you're when you're you know saying okay, you've got the limit. It's once again, I'm going to go back to my little timer here. It's really good for kids to actually know how much time they're going to have instead of being nebulous. Like, well, when I tell you, get off. So give them a give them that timer so they really know. Okay, I have 25 minutes, and make that a thing. And then when they're done, if you're going to go right into another activity, that's like a terrible activity, for example, like after this, you're going to do your homework or you're going to set the table. You're probably going to struggle more with them resisting. So try doing another activity offline that they actually like, like after we, you know, after you have your 25 minutes of screen time, then we're going to read a book together or we're going to go outside and play tetherball or whatever it is that gives them something that's not just like what in their view, a terrible thing. And really bringing them back into that physical world through sensory experiences is key. And that's where, again, you can employ your, your family pets as your friend. <laughs> I mean, oh, the cat needs to get brushed or, oh, you know, the dog hasn't had a snack this afternoon. Can you go get a bone for her? And that's like, you know, I mean, and so it, it transitions more smoothly. And, um, and, and to that, you know, kids, they really need to discharge that energy. I know we talked a little bit about it in our presentation of when they're, when they're exposed to this fast moving screens, they build up this, all this adrenaline and cortisol in their system, and it needs to discharge. So having them do something physical with their bodies is really, really good, 
you know, good practice. For good the kids. Yeah. 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 Even yeah. like yeah. keeping yeah. like a jump rope next to the, for, for my son, who's now much older, but for my son watching TV, it was always hard to get him off of a show and we just kept a jump rope next to it. And so he'd get off and he'd, you know, start jumping and there, and then it was just a much happier, smoother <laughs> transition. But again, that rhythm of jumping we'll incorporates that sen sensory stuff. About like middle school and high schoolers that really, like you talked about exercise, important enthusiasm, just that across your centered acronym, ones that all they want to do is be on their screen time. So how do you, how can you have them integrate like some of those enthusiasm and hobbies back into their lives that, that maybe did when they were younger? Yeah. Well, yeah. I would really incorporate what they call bridging which is use the screen time to research something to do offline. So if you, if you, you know, maybe they used to be really into, I don't know. Well, I'll give a, per, I'll okay. give it a, per, a personal example for my own home. So I have a 17 year old who really likes to work with his hands. He's like pretty handy. So he'll go on YouTube and he'll look at, I don't know, he made this really cool thing using the law of physics. It was like this balancing thing and it was really cool. So YouTube helped him, but then he was offline doing the actual thing. So we recommend doing stuff like that. That's bridging in its finest, right? Because it's a win-win. Okay. He, Thank you for that. Use his hands. I like that. Bridging is a good one. It's a tool, you know, yeah. it's intentional yeah. use. Okay. And then we've got one final question. Okay. Um, we appreciate all the questions that are coming in and we're trying to get through as many as possible, but uh, just kind of want to wrap up with, you know, one of the things we know and we've heard from parents, it can be such a power struggle with media and screen time. So is there any tools, thoughts, recommendations you can give to parents to help their kids start learning how to manage their own screen time limits, advocating for themselves in that area that can be so hard, especially as they're getting older and they're, you know, they leave off to high school and then to college. Like how, how do you help them manage it on their own? So developmentally, like we talked about at the beginning of the, of the presentation, kids have a really hard time managing when they're little. So they really need us to be managers, right? When they're little. So we have, we're going to have more controls and stuff. But as our kids get older, I mean, we have to realize when they turn 18, they're going out into the real world and they can do whatever they want. Right. So I, you know, in our families, we've kind of like used a gradual approach. So we don't, it's the same thing with driving, right? We don't, we don't start out giving them everything, but I, you know, we, you can gradually give your kids more and more apps. There are more and more time on certain apps and social media introduce that gradually. And then what I like to do with my kids is just have like kind of informal check-ins and just say, how's it going? Like, how's, what do you think of Snapchat or what do you, how do you, how do you feel after you use that? Is that and I really try to, we really encourage families to just engage in that conversation because I don't want a power struggle. Like I don't need any more problems in my life. So <laughs> we really try to make it a collaborative approach with our kids. And, and they really respond to that when you, you ask them for their input, right? Like how's it make you feel? Um, and then really get their buy-in and work together. That's going to give you a whole lot more mileage. And it, you need to have a lot of little conversations. It's like staying hydrated. You have to drink a lot of a little <laughs> sips of water. You can't hear. That was so well timed. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, you can't drink a gallon of water on Sunday and think that you're going to be fine on Wednesday. So it's a lot of little, just little conversations and it kind of sets it up for family culture. And this is our family, what, how our family does it. Perfect. Well, thank you both for being here tonight and especially for our parents. Thank you for submitting all these questions. Um, we appreciate that. Unfortunately, we're not able to get through all of them, but um, we just are happy that you guys were here tonight, giving us some good information on uh, how to develop healthy screen habits, what's happening in our children's brain developmentally. So full of a lot of information. So thank you guys again. We also want to thank Maria Melendez, our wonderful translator who is with us every presentation. Thank you for being with us here, Maria. 
And just want to let our parents know that we will have this video uh, posted on the Conejo USD YouTube channel in the next couple of days. We'll be sending you a link to the email that you use to register for this webinar. Um, so you can be able to access that uh, right from, from the email. Uh, we also want to thank all of our parents and guardians for attending tonight workshop brought to you by the Conejo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program.